All right, so today is the second lecture we're going to have now on vectorized execution. So in our last class, we spent time talking about the Columbia paper that showed how to vectorize a bunch of different relational operators in um, or different relational operators in a database system. Um, and then we said there was this big assumption that they make where they assume everything fits into your CPU caches, and they're always dealing with 32-bit integers for values and 32-bit integer keys. Um, so now we want to look at other alternatives to do uh, uh, vectoriz vectorization in a database system. So this today's lecture is actually gonna be, my part is going to be short because I have a flight. Uh, so I'm going to do the first 30 minutes and talk about bit slicing and bit weaving, um, and then Prashant's going to going to step in and then present the uh, ROF paper uh, because that's his work on applying vectorization in, in, inside of a uh, Peloton in our compilation engine. So he'll finish up uh, with discussion of that. And so unfortunately, I also have to take my Surface, so we're not, we, we won't have a recording for that, but that's all right. All right, so uh, real quick also to say, too, that I haven't looked at the pull requests. That's my goal for this week, and I'll send everyone feedback and comments about uh, the progress on it. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to have everyone, um, once I go through and uh, grade the, the code reviews, we'll go ahead and delete all the, the pull requests, and that way it's not building every single time you, you know, as you continue to make changes to it. And then at the end of the semester, we'll, we'll do this all over again. Right. We'll, we'll just close the PR, all the comments and everything will still be there, um, so there'll be a history of things, but then you'll start over with a new PR uh, at the end of the semester. Okay? So any questions about the, the Project 3? Okay, so I want to jump back for a second and refresh your memory about bitmap encoding bitmap indexes. Um, because one of the things we're going to talk about today is, in, for, for at least for my part, is alternatives to representing the, the, the database, your tuples, a different ways to store it, as, a, as another way to get better parallelization at, at a bit level. So to do that, before we can talk about bit weaving or bit slicing, we want to talk about, just go back to the beginning with bitmap encoding. Right, so bitmap indexes are really straightforward. Right, we just said that if we have a, an attribute that has a small domain of values, right, in this case we have a sex column, so if there's, if for this example there's only two possible values, uh, male or female, so we can represent uh, this, uh, this attribute in, as two, two separate bitmaps, right? We have one for the male value and one for the female value, and then we just have a one or a zero to say whether the particular tuple at this position has a particular value, right? And we talked about before that if you have a large domain, then maybe a bitmap index or bitmap encoding like this is not going to be a good idea because, again, you have to have a bitmap for every possible value that could ever be. So this is, this is sort of called uh, a quality coding or the, the basic scheme you get for bitmap encoding, right? The idea, again, you just have a single bitmap for every unique value, and there's a one and a zero. But it's not the only way that you could represent this data uh, in a bitmap. Another approach to do what is called range, range encoding, and this is basically you have a bitmap represent a range of values rather than a single discrete value, right? So you could say you have a bitmap for all zip codes that start with 152, right, in, 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 your, in, your, in your database. And of course, now this means that if you want to go find an exact uh, tuples with an, an exact value, you have to check the bitmap first, and then you have to go then check the actual tuples to see whether that matches your quality predicate. But in this case here, you would have to store less, less, less possible, uh, less bitmaps for all the discrete values. But the other two approaches that are uh, less common, but I think are interesting to discuss, and then we'll segue into to bit weaving, is to do hierarchical encoding and then bit sliced encoding. So the basic idea of hierarchical coding, which I'll show in the next slide, is that you have a, a way to, to represent sparse bitmaps efficiently by having this tree that ha tells you whether that actually could be a possible value within a domain. And then bit slicing, again, we'll see this where we store actually the, the, bit, the single bits, or like the radixes of the bitmap for a value, uh, all together contiguously. So again, we'll go through each of these one by one. So hierarchical coding, the basic idea here is that uh, the, it's, it's represented as a tree, and the, the, at each node in the tree, you'll have a one or a zero that says whether there is a possible value 
uh, with a one at, then at the child represented by a position in that node. So in this case here at the very top, the root has one, zero, one, zero. And so again, each position in the bitmap represents a, a child. So if, if it's one, then we know we have something on this child. If it's zero, then we know we don't have anything here. So in this case here, the second position is zero. So the second child is all zeros, and these are all zeros. So everything below that is going to be all zeros as well. All right? So if you want to take the keys uh, listed here, right, we would represent them in different positions. And to say we, the key exists, we would have a, a one or a zero. Right? So in this example here, I'm showing you that we're storing the zeros uh, for these lower two trees here and in the leaf nodes. But in actuality, you don't need to store this at all, right? This is just for, for you know, to represent it, I, I'm adding this. But in, in practice, you don't have to store this because once you know you have a zero here, there's never going to be anything down below this. So it, you can skip it entirely, right? So this seems like a you know, kind of nifty way to represent a bitmap more efficiently. Um, the downside is that, and as far as I know, nobody actually does this in practice, uh, is because that the having this tree structure means branching when you're doing lookups, and that's going to hurt your performance in terms of uh, like cache misses and th things like that. So this is just one way you could store a bitmap differently than the equality coding that I, that I showed before. Right? But the advantage, again, is that you know, originally we'd have to store this as an 8-byte uh, bitmap, but now we can encode it as a 4-byte bitmap. So the other one uh, encoding scheme that I think is more interesting uh, and is be relevant when we start talking about vectorization is to do uh, bit slice encoding. And so the way to think about a bit, uh, like a bit slices is that in the same way that we took a row store and then sort of flipped it along on, on its axis and then stored it as a columns, we're going to do the same thing here, but instead of storing, instead of worrying about actually taking the entire tuple or the attributes within a single column and then flipping it, we're actually going to take the bits that represent the actual values in a column and flip it to be stored vertically, right? So I'll go, go through an example here. So here we have in our simple table, right? We have the uh, seven zip codes for all the, the locations I lived to lived in throughout my life, and this is real, right? So I grew up in Maryland, 2042. I spent some time in Compton, and then now we're here in, in Pittsburgh, 15217. So let's say we take 21042. And the way we would represent this as a bit slice is that we first generate the, the bitmap or the binary encoding of this value. So if you take 21042 and run it through the bin function of Python, you get this bitmap like this. And then we're going to run along now and have a, uh, a bitmap slice or a bit slice for every single uh, position in our value. Right? So this thing has uh, uh, 17 bits, so we're going to have 17, uh, you know, 17 bit slices. And then we have an additional one to keep track of whether it's null or not. So now when we start populating this, uh, say we just take this, you know, this cursor here, and as we scan across, we'll have an entry in the bit slice for every, you know, for every single position here in our bitmap. Right? So now we can do this for all, all the other ones. Right, and now you now you should be able to see what I was what I meant that we're storing it in a in a in a, in a columnar bit manner, right? So each of these slices is a contiguous block of memory. So we're going to have just the first bit for every single value will be stored contiguously in this bitmap here, All right? And so the reason why we want to do this and what makes it really interesting is that there's some nifty tricks we can do to speed up our uh, predicate evaluation when we execute queries when we store data like this. Right, so let's say that we have a uh, simple select statement, select star from the customer table, where the zip code is less than 15217, my home address here in Pittsburgh. So the way we would execute this query is that uh, we're going to walk across the, uh, each slice and then construct a, a result bitmap that says whether they're the the, the tuple at a particular position in the bit slice uh, satisfied our predicate, right, 0, 1. And then we know that when we go look at the next bit slice, we only have to check the ones that were, that were positive or 1 in the, in the last bit slice we checked. Right? So in this case here, let's say we take actually just the first three bit slices. right? 
So the, we know that this entry here, 2, corresponds to 15217. That's what I look up on here. So here we know that the first three positions in, uh, in the, bit, the bitmap rep binary representation of this, of this value is just three zeros. So that means when we do our predicate evaluation, since we're looking for uh, values that are less than 15217, that means we know that since this is all zeros, if there's any tuple that has at least one one in the first three bits in these bit slices, then we know it has to be greater than, uh, than what we're looking for, and we just ignore it entirely. Right? So in this case here, we can skip the, the, ent the, 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 the first three entries. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, if you have a one in the first three slices, we can skip that entirely. Right? So we have one here, we skip this, we have one here, we have one here, skip this. So the only thing now, when we start looking at the other slices, uh, we only need to look at these three guys here, because they're the ones that only have, only have zeros. Right? So by, this allows us to do what is called early pruning by identifying what the possible values could be as early as possible as we're going across and looking at the bit slices, we can recognize that uh, there's no way that the tuples represented by the bit slices here and here and here could ever be less than this, because you know that we now have a one, so now when we go scan across look at the rest of bit slices, we can skip them entirely. Yes? So why does your like, I can be interpreted into like 17 chunks of the binary? Say it again, why doesn't what? Why does a, a zip, zip code? Interpret it into like 17 instead of all the numbers of trunks of memory. Uh, Your question is why is. Uh, we have like 17 columns. Right yeah, so, so let's go back here. So we're taking this first number here, right? 21042. When we, we, we convert it to binary, right? From an integer, you know, inter, a decimal rep representation to a binary representation, right? We had this binary string here. And then so we store every single one, every single bit here is corresponds to another bit slice, right? And it's just those values going across. And whether the first column stands for The first column is whether it's null or not, right? So again, so that at this point here, when I'm looking at just the, the, first, uh, the first three bit, bit slices, I'm looking at all these values, but I'm only looking at the, the uppermost bits. And I know that if the, if the, based on my predicate, if they don't satisfy the predicate at the first upper bit, then they can, it doesn't matter what comes afterwards. So I can just skip, you know, any evaluation of them so later on. Pre-process like negative numbers. Like. Pre-process what, sorry? And negative numbers. <laughs> oh, his statement is, does that mean like I need to maintain a bitmap that says at this offset, I didn't evaluate, they evaluated the false on the last bit slice I looked at. So therefore don't evaluate it going down. Yeah, so for inactive numbers, you have to sort of, sort of maintain another interpreter. You say, are you saying inactive numbers? Yeah. Like negative. Oh, negative. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, for neg. yes. This is just assuming not to complement this. Yes. Right? These are, yeah. These are unsigned. All right, so now the one of the cool, thi other cool things you can do with bit slicing is that it also makes it really efficient to compute some aggregations. So to compute the sum, all you need to do now is just count the, the number of ones in each slice, and then you multiply it by the, the, the base value that corresponds to that slice. So if you take the very, very first slice, you count all the number of ones, and then you multiply it by 2 to the 17, and that converts it to the, its, its correct magnitude or correct form. And then you do that for the next slice, right? Take all the ones in slice 16 and multiply by 2 to 16, right? And you just add these values together, and that produces the, the correct sum. Now, the reason why this is, this is interesting is because it's actually really cheap to count all the number of ones in a, in a bitmap or a bit vector. Does anybody know what that's called? What's that? Well, that's the instruction, but what is it really called? Like, in, in, C, in regular CS, what is it called? Or not in regular CS, in like algorithms, what is it called? It's a Hamming weight, right? So th there's a single instruction to do this that Intel added. So you can just take this bitmap and it'll produce that value for you, right? So this is another good example. If you can represent the data in a, in a different way, 
we can then exploit SIMD uh, or, or leverage SIMD to do a fairly efficient computations for this, right? And pretty much, I think the, if, you, if you read the Wikipedia page for Hemingway, uh, there's a it, pretty much every single architecture has uh, has a Hemingway instruction that's very efficient. All right, so the the next thing we can talk about now is if we understand bit slicing, um, there's some observations we can make about some of the inefficiencies that we saw from the, the Columbia paper about, and there's ways to actually overcome them by using something that looks a lot like bit slicing to store our data in a more efficient manner that makes it uh, more amenable to, uh, to, to vectorization. So the first issue we had uh, from, the, from the, last, the last class was that, they, again, they were making this big assumption that everything was 32-bit integers with 32-bit uh, pointers to tuples. Um, but if you go beyond that, or if you have, uh, uh, if you're compressing data that is not exactly 32 bits, right, the encoded value is not exactly 30 bits, then this becomes problematic because it does not fit cleanly into our SIMD register lanes in order to compute the, the do the computations that we want to do. So this means that before we take data out of memory or our CPU caches and then put it into our registers, we have to do some extra work to transform it into make sure everything's aligned nicely. The other issue is that, uh, and, we'll, and what we're going to try to solve next is that just because we said last class we were going to choose algorithms or, or, and, and, and ways to vectorize the, the, the operators, we, ch we try to choose ones that were always uh, utilizing all the lanes at every single time. So we weren't computing things where we already knew the answer to it. We weren't essentially wasting work. But just because all the lanes are fully utilized, doesn't mean all the bits within a single lane could be fully utilized. Right, so now we're going sort of at even more lower level. So what I mean by this, to say that we have uh, two vectors, we want to do a, a quality comparison, and we want to use SIMD for this, right? and it'll, it'll, it'll generate uh, a bitmap with 0, 1 to say whether it matches. So within a single lane, right, the, we would represent the value uh, as, as this, this, in a binary form like this. And we know, just as we saw in the bit slicing, we know that for the, for the first couple uh, uh, comparisons that we're going to do, uh, we're finding useful data, but then when we find, or find that the, the values are equivalent, but then when we get to this point here, the, the top guy is different than the bottom one. So it doesn't matter what comes after this, we know it can never be equal, so this is essentially wasted work. Right, and this is because this is the way we have to rep. You know, we normally write code. We know we does. You know, we write if clauses. Does something equal something? Right. We're just taking two variables, two values, and checking to see whether they match. But underneath the covers, uh, you know, the the actual some of these bits could actually be could be used for other things, uh, because we know that no matter what, once we see that these guys don't match, all this other stuff is just wasted work. So that's the problem we're going to try to solve with, uh, with, with bit weaving. So bit weaving is an alternative storage layout for uh, DSM or columnar databases. And the idea here is that it's, it's, we're going to organize the data in such a way that makes it really efficient to do predicate evaluation on uh, in-memory compressed data. And we don't have to use SIMD for, uh, for all of this, but SIMD is going to allow us to get uh, really good performance for this. So the way at a high level to think about what's going to happen is we're always going to be using uh, order-preserving dictionary encoding for all our data. Um, and then we're going to try to get what's called, again, bit-level parallelization within a single SIMD lane to make sure that every single bit in a, uh, in a SIMD register and in a lane is always doing something useful. And then the other cool thing about this is that they're going to leverage only the common SIMD instructions, right? So the last class, they had this gather, gather and scatter was sort of the key primitive that they used to make all these things work. But as we said, at the, uh, the, the Xeon CPUs that were available to them in 2015 didn't actually have, have those instructions in SIMD, so they had to emulate it to, 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 to overcome that limitation. So this paper was written back, back in 2013, so this is even older than the Columbia one, and they definitely didn't have scatter and gather back then, but they didn't require, to use, uh, require that at all in these algorithms. So in this paper, this is based on, uh, this work was done in the context of this storage engine, database engine at University of Wisconsin called QuickStep. QuickStep has then, has now become a Apache incubator project uh, in 2016, 
Uh, so it is an open source thing that people are using. Uh, the thing I'll say, though, is that the, according to the authors of the paper, the quick step version you get on the internet, like from Apache, does not contain any of the bit weaving stuff here, although it was originally written in, in the context of this. So this work was, was spearheaded by Jignesh Patel, uh, pictured here. And he's the he's like the hardcore database systems expert at uh, at University of Wisconsin. In my opinion, he's up there with like the hyper guys as being like one of the best data, database researchers in the world. So I really think this stuff is great. Honestly, also Jignesh is a badass. Uh, he looks very unassuming, but um, he has told me crazy stories about beating people up on buses, like when he was like in elementary school, go, going to class in India. Like he was. He, he, yes, I'll stop there. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, there's, there's two layouts we're going to have in Bitweaving. The first is horizontal encoding, and then the second is vertical encoding. So, again, all of this is still in the context of a column store. So, we're talking about encoding of a single column, but within that column, we can sort of have a row oriented layout or a column oriented layout. And this is at, at, at the bit level. So, the. Uh, We'll go through each of these, but they're, they're, this is going to allow us, by storing the data in, this, in these different manners, uh, this is going to allow us to get a bunch of optimization that we, can no, we would not normally be able to get if we were just storing the values in their whole form, like all the bits, you know, one after another in, in the single column. So for horizontal storage, uh, the, for this, we're going to have an example of, we have 10, 10 tuples, and we're going to... We're going to break them up into two segments. Um, and for these, I'm encoding, in this example here, I'm encoding all the values as three bits. But, uh, and that's, that's what the paper uses, and they use 8-bit processor words. But that's just a generalization that, you know, for, for, to simplify the explanation. Uh, there's nothing about what we're talking about here. It has specific to be exactly three bits. Like you could use more bits and larger processor words. Um, just for simplicity, we're doing this. So for here, these are just encoded values that I've listed here, right? So we, or it's, it's two to the eight, uh, two to the three possible, possible values. So there's eight distinct values we could have for uh, all our tuples here. And as I said, we're going to break up our data into these segments. Um, and this is just done for, for organizing the data in, in our internally. All right, so for the first segment what we're going to do uh, is we're going to store the data the, their bits in horizontally, contiguously, um, within a single processor word. So each of these vectors corresponds to a processor word. And then in this case, in their example, they're eight-bit words. And so the 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 way it's organized is that the the first tuple appears at the first position of the first word, and then the second tuple appears at the first position of of the second word. And then so it goes zero, one, two, three and then jump back up here and start over for the second uh, position in the first word, four, five, six, seven. And this will, this will matter later on when we see how they actually uh, combine the results of doing these evaluations together. It makes it, 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 makes it actually work out if you, if you organize it this way rather than going, you know, zero, one, two, three, right? So it's, it's, you start at the bottom, start from the top, go to the bottom, and then jump to the, to the next position and finish it up that way. The every also tuple in, in this encoding is also going to have a one-bit delimiter um, just represented by zero here. Think of this sort of as padding that says, you know, here's when one tuple starts and the next one begins. Um, what we'll see later on also, too, is that when they do predicate evaluation, this is actually where they're going to store the result of, of the predicate. So rather than having another bitmap stored somewhere else that says whether something you know, evaluated true or not, they're actually going to store it right, right in here. Um, there is a version in the paper that says you don't have to use this uh, extra bit. Like you can actually just store it, you know, without this extra padding. Uh, but then you end up having to do more computation to put it into the form you need, or to get the, get the result out and put it into a form you need to actually then be able to use it to do continuing query processing for other parts of the system. All right, so let's see how we're going to execute a query on this. So for this, we're going to use uh, a simple query: select star from table, value less than five. And then we're just only going to deal with a, a, a one, uh, one vector from the previous slide, right? So this would be tuple 0, tuple 4. And then the second vector here is just the, encoding, the, the binary encoding version of our predicate here. 
So the way we're going to evaluate this uh, is that we're going to compute a mass that corresponds to uh, that 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 corresponds to what our predicate actually trying to do, and then we have this formula here. Uh, you take the x or with mask and x plus y, and then you end it with the negation of the mask. So this is this mask. This this formula here is specific to this particular uh, predicate, right? So there's a different formula for equality or greater than or or, or, or greater than or equal to, right? And then it's gonna this this formula is gonna produce out a selection vector. Again, that'll tell us at the at the delimiter whether the tuple that corresponds to the position represented by the delimiter evaluated to true or not. So in this case here, this first one is 1 because 1 is less than 5 because this is 0, 0, 1. That, that's, a, that's decimal 1. And then this is set to 0 because 5 is, is, is not less than 6. Or sorry, 5 is, 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 is not greater than 6. So that doesn't match down there. All right? So the crazy thing about all of this is that Everything I'm describing here actually does not even need to use SIMD at all, right? Like, you could write this with SISD instructions, uh, right? and it actually would be really efficient because th these are low-level bit, bit operations that the hardware can actually do very efficiently. So we're not even got into SIMD yet. You can, all, you can do all of this in, in, in SISD. And so in this case here, also, we're dealing with 8-bit eight uh, processor words and 3-bit values. But if you had a 64-bit processor word, then you could store 16 3-bit values in there. And again, the same formula would do all of them in parallel. So there's another way to get vectorization without actually relying on, on SIMD. What I'll say also, too, is that uh, these formulas here wasn't, were not invented by the Wisconsin people. This actually comes from Leslie Lamport's paper from like the 1970s, before CPUs even had uh, uh, SIMD. So again, this, this is just an old idea, but now applying the context of, of new hardware. So now let's see how to do this uh, with a bunch of uh, vectors at the same time using the horizontal uh, scheme. So for this, we're going to do all the same steps we did in, in the last slide, and that's going to produce uh, four different vectors here. And again, the, the, the delimiter space tells us whether it actually matched or not to, to 0, 1. But now we need to combine these uh, selection vectors and put it into a form that's actually usable by us so that we can figure out you know, what tuples actually pass on to the next part of our query plan. So for this, we could do the most naive thing and just have a for loop and scan over every single bitmap and check to see whether the value is, is, is 1 or not. Um, but we can actually just do very simple bit shifting operations to slide over now the, the, the delimiter value into a different position that corresponds to the position of the tuple that, that it represents. And this is why they had, again, they, they had the, the go from the top to the bottom when you start adding the tuples rather than going from, from left and right. So now that we have all of these guys in, in the correct position, it's a, another cheap operation to then combine it together and produce a selection vector that tells us whether the tuple added particular position matched or not. All right? So again, I, I it's, it's like using the low-level constructs of bit operations and, uh, and SIMD to actually do more complicated things, which I really like this paper because of this. So now the selection vector that came out uh, of this is, um, as I said, is, is a basically a bit map that says whether a tuple at a particular position mapped to true or not. Um, and in the example here, I showed that you can sort of co combine everything together, and that tells you whether something is, is true. Um, but then you still need to go back and then scan through the, the selection vector and, and find all the ones that are, that are uh, uh, set to true. And then you, you know what offset they are in, then you can go look up and find the extra tuple that you want. But this is actually could be expensive to do. An alternative... Uh, approach is to pre-compute the position table based on the, uh, the selection vector that is generated. So this is actually a technique that I think came from, from VectorWise, uh, and then this is actually something Bashant uses in his work as well. Uh, the basic idea is that we know that, in this case here, we only have our selection vector is going to cor correspond to 8 bits, so there's only two of the eight different, uh, different possible values we could, we could have represented by the selection vector. So all we need to do now is just have a 
a lookup table that says for every single possible value uh, we, we could have, it'll give us the, 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 the vector of the offsets that correspond to this. So this is the selection vector that our operation generated before. And in decimal form, it maps to, to 150. And then in our position table, we just have at position 150, we would have a vector that says, oh, there's a 1 at 0, 3, 5, and 6. There's a more efficient way to do this rather than having to do, again, the for loop and, and iterate over it. All right, now the alternative storage is to do, uh, the alternative way is also to do vertical storage. Again, we're going to break up our data into two segments, but instead of having all the bits for every single tuple stored contiguously, instead we're going to all store the, the bits at a, at a given position all contiguously. Yes? Yes, can I go back to the previous slide? Yes. Um, wouldn't you generate a very large position table? And when you look at that table, you somehow like, uh, flush out some caches. And so the statement is, wouldn't you have a really large position table? You don't have two, there's only, in this case here, we have an eight bit selection vector. There's only two of the eight different possible values. So it's not that big. It'll fit one in like L2. All right, so again, instead of storing now in the vertical storage, instead of storing the, all the bits for a single tuple contiguously, we're instead going to store all the bits at a given slice contiguously, right? So in this case here, in our first segment, we have in a single processor word, we have all the bits for the first position, and then the second process where we have all the bits for the second position, right? And the same, same thing for the other, the other side here. And so here we see it actually doesn't matter now how many tuples uh, we store in or that, are, that are in a single segment, we're always going to have to use the same number of words, right? It's just that known that there's all these other tuples here, there's, there's, there's nothing there, so this is set to zero. So let's see now how to execute a query on this. Uh, so Say we want to do a lookup on key equals two, and so we can represent that in, in, uh, as a, in binary form like this. So what we'll do is we'll just take the first vector and then do a SIMD compare with a vector of all zeros, because it's zero here, and that'll produce, again, a selection vector that says which, which positions had tuples that match this. Then when we go now to the, uh, the second position, we, ne we need to know that from the last time uh, on the first position, we had a bunch of tuples that didn't match. So we need to, we need to carry over that information so that if the, in the next uh, bit slice we, we evaluate, we don't want to have them actually evaluate to true if they were a false in the previous one because we need to and all these things together. So we'll end up actually doing a uh, SIMD compare across all three vectors, and then that'll produce our, our correct answer here. And now, obviously, uh, in this, at this point here, although we have, so have another position to look at, uh, all our tuples or all our, 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 our positions and our selection vector are zero, which we can compute very efficiently with the, the Hamming weight. Uh, so we know that there's no even point even actually looking at the next position, because if everything's false here, then everything should be false in the next one too. So we can do early pruning and cut everything off. Yes? always have to like compare all the bits even though like some of them you don't have to validate. The this question is, in this case here, uh, since I know that some of them evaluated to false, do I still have to compare them on the next time around? In this case, yes. Alright, uh, so to finish up real quickly, uh, there's one graph I want to show you because that sort of explains clearly everything that's going on. So they have a simple, simple micro benchmark. Uh, that has a simple query that does, does a, a count star on a table uh, with a, uh, uh, a less than predicate. And this database is, de is derived from TPCH, so it has a billion tuples and a uniform uh, skew distribution. And the selectivity of the predicate is 10%. So the reason why they're doing a count star is because it doesn't have to materialize any output right, of the actual tuples. It's just a single, uh, single decimal that says you know, what the count actually was. Um, so this is just going at the, what's the bare metal performance you can get from actually evaluating predicates in the engine. Right, so this one graph here shows a comparison of the bit weaving vertical versus bit weaving horizontal, along with a naive non-vectorized, you know, sequential scan of the table, and then a uh, basic uh, vectorized uh, sequential scan when you grab one tuples together and then use SIMD instructions to do, to do the evaluation. So. Right off the bat, you see that you get about a 2x performance of, 
uh, the SIMD scan over the naive scan just based on the fact that you can parallelize things uh, with, the, with, with SIMD instructions. The, then you get another about 2 to 3x performance difference between the, the bit weaving approach versus the regular uh, the, the SIMD scan. And this is because that uh, you're having fewer cache misses because you end up having to, to process less data. But then as you get to a larger and larger uh, uh, number of bits using to encode your data, uh, you see that there's a, a slight difference in performance here between the, the vertical versus the horizontal. And this is attributed to the fact that the vertical uh, scheme can do early pruning, and therefore it can just end up looking at less data, and therefore you have fewer cache misses. And as far as I know, this little blip over here is when we go from uh, 31 bits to 32 bits. So now with 32 bits plus the, uh, plus the, the, the padding, in the case of the horizontal approach, then you have, have to represent this as 33 bits, and that, that doesn't align nicely. OK. Yes? Oh, sorry. The y-axis is the number of cycles uh, for code. Uh, I think the number of cycles per like tuple, okay. right? So if you have more cache misses, it takes more cycles, right? If you measure it in terms of instructions, then you would you would miss the the cache cache miss penalty. Okay, so to finish up, uh, the what we'll see next with Prashant is that we so far we've been sort of talking about these these different topics, how to improve query query execution performance. Uh, isolated from each other. So like we spent time talking about query compilation and then we spent time talking about vectorization. But how you actually combine these two, two concepts together to get the overall best performance is actually not something that has been covered uh, in what we talked about so far. So what's going to be next is that for Prashant's work, he's going to show that in the same way that uh, well, he's going to show that, in, that the, if you in order to, to apply these things together, there is some actual actual work you have to do. It's just not a matter of taking like query compilation and say, "Oh, I'm going to vectorize things." Uh, you have to be a little more careful about how you uh, how you sort of stage your operations or the instructions when you actually when you process things. And I would say the the bit weaving, bit slicing work is also an example where, in the same way in compilation, where we write code, we have our engine generate code in a way that is not the simplest way for humans to understand. If we encode our data in a way that is not so much easy for us to understand, but is the best way for the, the CPU to actually crunch on, then we can end up getting better performance. OK? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. Then I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives